I'm going to show you a picture of a fast food uh, convenience store by my last church. Uh, it's now a circle, uh, it's, uh, it's a uh, 76 station. But when I was there for almost 20 years, it was a, it was a 7-Eleven store. So I guess they switched while I, after I left, so we'll pray for them. But that particular store, I went into all the time because if, um, if you go back down this street, my church was just right over here. So I, I went in there on Sunday mornings to get a cup of coffee, and it was only one service. Wow. <laughs> Do you know how simple that was? Now it's like I get to the third service, and I'm like, did I tell him this? Did I say this? Yeah, doing threes is not simple. Uh, and so uh, one, that, sorry, I've been in there lots of times. So that particular store, uh, was where our church was located, uh, there was a lot of crime activity because there were gangs. And I knew all that because I was the chaplain for the sheriff's department of 1,300 officers. So I knew all more than I wanted to when I went to a police briefing. Um, plus, I had the head of homicide on my elder board, a federal agent on my elder board. So, you know, I knew more than I ever wanted to know. Uh, so uh, after a typical elder meeting, it wasn't uncommon at 10, 30, 11 o'clock at night, we would hear a 9-millimeter fire in the distance. And we all knew because we all shot and pistols. And we knew what that was. And so it was kind of like that place for a church. That does not happen here, which is the crime here is, is really interesting because you, you don't really hear about it. But where I was at before, it was a little different. Um, and so one day, uh, a, a young man walked into that store uh, with a pistol, uh, brand new pistol, pistol. He wanted money. And so he showed the pistol to the cashier. The cashier uh, emptied the cash drawer and gave it to him. And he took off and thought, eh, easy robbery. Uh, so the police showed up, Stockton PD, and uh, they began taking witness testimony. And uh, then somebody went in the back and pulled the video. The guy had no mask. He had no hat, no hood, nothing. Just him. Be like if I walked in with a gun and asked for money. <laughs> I mean, not that I would, but you can imagine. I mean, uh, yeah. And so, you know, the guy walked in, walked out. Uh, and so they ran the, you know, it was high. You know, you know how sometimes they, they show you the crime video and it's so grainy? It's like, they need to upgrade the cameras. <laughs> Do you, I mean, you know, you have that problem? This was a high definition camera. You could see this guy as plain as day. Now, what was interesting was his defense once they arrested the guy, because it didn't take him long to figure out who that was. Uh, and when they arrested him, his defense went something like this. That's not me. <laughs> <laughs> I started laughing when I heard that. I'm like, are you serious? Look at the video. Look at you. Identical match. He's like, it's just somebody who resembles me. Is that a defense? No, no that's not a defense. Uh, I was thinking to myself, you ever want to be put on a jury? Everybody tries to get out of it. Yeah, you know, it's like, just vote guilty when you hear that, you know. This would have been a fast trial, would it not? Saw the video, it's him, guilty, etc. cetera. So uh, what was that guy trying to do? He was trying to get out of the crime, right? You know, he was trying to get, he was, you know, passing the buck, or he wasn't taking responsibility for his sinful actions. Just like sinners do. None are here. <laughs> I'm not responsible. Okay, let's just back up. Let's switch uh, motifs from criminal activity at a 7-Eleven type store to marriage. Uh, if you have a marriage and it's dysfunctional, because I, I, I'm with people in, in counseling, so is the rest of the pastoral staff. Half the time, as a pastor, you feel like a detective. I'm serious, just to be honest. Who's telling me the truth? Is there a perception of reality? I mean, is it good? Is it bad? And sometimes we compare notes and we're like, we have no idea. And then other times it's like, it's really apparent who's telling you the truth. Because you can't get to health and wholeness until someone admits, I'm the perpetrator. Am I Am I right? And so it's like, wow, it's, people are so adept when there's dysfunction at passing the buck or not accepting responsibility. It's her act. If she just gets her act together, then we're good. And then you're listening to him going, ah, I think you're the one that needs to get your act together. So it's built into our DNA to uh, not accept responsibility for our actions, right? Uh, which is when you read Romans 9 through 11, uh, you're going to find uh, the Jewish people do not want to accept responsibility for their actions, just like sinners. And, and when you have children, you never teach them this premise of never accepting responsibility for the actions. It just comes in the DNA, <laughs> sinful. So when Paul is speaking to his Jewish brethren in chapters 9 through 11, he's tapping into a mindset that is uh, that's alive and well today, and it's the mindset, it's not me. I didn't do this. I'm not responsible. So how does this work? Well, just to review, and then we're going to review for just a few minutes, because it's a complicated chapter, no, there's no doubt, because he's speaking to Jews uh, and Jewish thinking, and we're kind of one step removed from that, being Westerners. And so what Paul is talking about um, uh, in Romans thus far is he's talked about 
chapters 1 to 8, justification by faith, not by works. You don't get saved because you're Jewish. You don't get saved because you obey the Torah. You get saved because you come to Christ in faith. He's been talking about that. The Jews, because Paul's a Jew, he knows the questions that they formulate because he used to formulate these questions before he was a Christian. So he has spoken eloquently in chapter 8, verses 30 and following, about what God is like when it comes down to salvation. And he has said that God is sovereign, providential. He has foreknowledge. He elects. He predestines. He chooses. He said these things. And so, so every Jew is going to be thinking, yeah, I, I get the whole election thing because he chose us as his people. He selected us as his people. We, we get that. But because he did that, the fact that we rejected him means we are, by definition, not responsible. See, Paul understands the argument. I'll say it again. If God chose them as a people and they rejected him when he came as the Messiah, the argument then would be, Paul, it's, draw, draw the dots, connect them. We're not responsible if predestination election is true. Well, he's been talking in chapter 9 about predestination election that God chooses. And if you will remember, we're still reviewing, because uh, you made, maybe all knew this Sunday. You weren't, maybe you weren't here last week. Um, in predestination election, he has chosen them. But when he chose the nation, if we, we were thinking about what he did, he didn't choose everybody in the genetic line to be part of the nation of Israel. So when it came down to choosing, well, Isaac and Ishmael, which one did he choose? Isaac, when he should have chosen Ishmael, but he said, no, I'm not going to choose the older, I'm going to choose the younger. When he came down to choosing uh, between Esau and Jacob, twins, Esau, he should have chosen because he's the older. He didn't choose Esau. He chose Jacob, the younger. And wow, I mean, he had issues. He wouldn't even be someone you would choose because he, he was a conniving deceiver. He chose him. But they could have both been part of that line of the tribe and the nation of Israel. But God said, I'm very specific on my choices. So when it comes down to the, he chose them as a nation, they rejected the Messiah. They're saying to Paul, we're not responsible. We, we, we didn't have a choice. Uh, in chapter 10, Paul's going to tell them, you and all sinners ha are responsible for what you do with the Messiah. You're responsible for your actions. Even in a world where God chooses and elects, your free will is still active. Now, uh, if you were to stop and ask me after the service, uh, Marty, do you believe in the doctrine of election and free will? Or do, do you believe in the doctrine of election and predestination? What do, what do you think I'm going to say? Yes. Then if you say, do you believe in the doctrine of free will? My answer is going to be yes. Yes. If you ask me, which I've been asked, can you blend them together perfectly? Answer, no, no, nobody can. Uh, it's impossible. Why? It's finite dimensionality where God is, an infinite world where we live in our dimensionality. You cannot compare the two. Remember Isaiah chapter 55, verse 7 and following, where God said, my thoughts are what? They are not your thoughts, neither are my ways your ways. He's way above us. And so Paul just assumes that uh, God chooses and God elects, and that we have free will. So he's answering these questions. So we've covered five questions so far that Jews typically struggle with as they look at uh, salvation by, through Jesus alone. Uh, and we want to dig deeper into question number five uh, because Paul does that in chapter 10. So we didn't finish the sermon last week. We're going to finish that sermon today. Uh, here's the question that Paul posed, question number five. Remember this, if you were here last week? What's the question? What's Paul, as Jews, we want to know, what's the relationship between God's election of us as his people and man's free will? Because we rejected the Messiah. So does that mean that it's over? You know, are we responsible for what we did? So Paul's going to give two answers uh, about the, the, that whole question. Uh, and we're still reviewing. I'll get to my sermon in a minute. This kind of takes a while. I know that's shocking for you, but hold on. What does Paul say is the relationship between election and free will? 